warm welcome to to all of you to this extremely important uh, webinar on food and farming systems and how agroecology can bring a change as you're aware that food and farming systems around the world are driving environmental degradation loss of vital ecosystems economic hardships for smallholders the majority of these problems are linked to industrial agriculture the input intensive crop monocultures and industrial feedlots we need a new agroecological paradigm rooted in a fundamentally different relationship between agriculture and environment and between food systems and society this is precisely what our eminent speakers are going to take us through may i request professor dr hans heren to please take the floor and uh, let me just tell the audience that hans joins us from california and it's 5:30 a.m there so we are really really thankful to you hans for taking this time out to join us thank you very much uh thank you very much rajiv for the introduction and and for the invitation also to anumita i uh, greatly appreciate it and i'm very happy to be on a panel with uh, my good friend ori hoffman and um others which i don't know but i will meet very soon so again thank you very much for the invitation so i will share my screen uh, so we can see the the powerpoint okay go to the floor. okay so i hope this is working just uh, uh, let me know so i will speak a little bit about agroecology you know the why the how the who but also uh, a little bit of the when uh, since that's uh, a top pick up so for discussion uh, as we seem to be running out of time so i i like to go back always when i discuss agroecology to uh, the international assessment of agricultural knowledge science and technology for development and actually india was very much involved in this with a number a good number of authors uh, from uh, the continent uh to look uh, backwards 50 years at, at agriculture as well as forward 50 years at you know where are we supposed or where should we be going so now it's been 11 years soon 12 years since this report uh, has been published it took 400 people 4 years to write uh with as a global report as well as uh, five sub uh, um regional reports um and they all sort of summarized uh, where do we need to go you know agriculture at the crossroads yeah crossroads which way do we go um we know that 58 countries actually signed on this report uh, that they will undertake major action to transform agriculture according to agroecological principles um as well uh, as looking at the entire food system because even 12 years back uh, we know that issues of climate change a lot of the socio economic uh, uh, problems with industrial and also conventional agriculture and that we needed to make uh, major changes so that was all enshrined in this report Uh, which uh, is as valid today as it was uh, a few years back and uh, again so we already said at that time that we needed a system change uh, uh that we needed more than just um uh, as a small you know changes and here so it's a picture of, of what is the food system you know it's not only just production it is actually everything which is around it from the input transformation output consumption and return to the land so so that we said so since then uh, there's been many reports written uh many uh, alarm button pushed about the climate change what do, do we need to do uh the young people got involved finally which i think is very good because i think that's the one thing which kind of pushed things the ipcc came along and says oh yes finally also agriculture needs to be changed you know they were sort of on the on the on the fence for a long time until it, 10 years after the report was published they came with their own a uh, report to say look agriculture should do something and then we had the sdgs 
So I'll go back to those because I think they are quite important. Uh, and not, not the least, uh, FAO itself, who uh, boo booed the report, never really uh, promoted it with its constituency. Uh, you know, the, the 140 or 50 countries which have joined the FAO, which are members. Uh, but they decided, uh, like two years ago, to write a report on agroecology or agroecological and other innovative approaches, which is a problem actually, these innovative approaches. But uh, in the end, I think there has been a change of heart within FAO uh, uh, and the CFS was then charged to write this report as a high level panel of experts who did this. And uh, not the least, uh, we just published a few weeks ago, uh, IASTD uh, plus 10, a transformation of food systems, the making of a paradigm shift. And so we, we, this book is available for free. Um, I'll put the link or in the chat box. Um, it relates what has been done since the publication of the original report and the call for a transformation of agriculture business as usual is not an option we said then and that we needed a paradigm shift a paradigm shift again to agroecological uh, practices in the full sense of uh, the food system uh, uh, phrase which includes everything again the three dimensions of sustainable development it's the environment, society, and the economy. So this is food system, you know, the simplification of food system today, you can see it in Asia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, you know, there's huge areas where we, palm oil has been produced like crazy. Here in Brazil, soybean production, like there's no tomorrow. Uh, uh, rape seed production in many places, also in Europe. Uh, uh, corn, which is the massive of the world, you know, the simplification of our food system by producing just these few crops. Uh, what does that lead to, uh, you know, uh, climate change? Uh, extreme weather uh, uh, events, with, then you have erosion, you have droughts. So this is where we are. To produce what? Too much food, not too little. We produce too much. We can, it's so cheap, we throw it away. And that actually has now been recognized for a few years. Something is being done about it. But again, you know, not enough, not fast enough. This is the big problem. And then look at the food system, which has been promoted today by, by many governments, by many development banks, you, uh, uh, and um, a foundation like the Gates Foundation, leaves so many people hungry around the world. So that's certainly not the system we want to promote for the future, right? And then uh, again, it's been said left and right, but again, very little being done. And that food system actually leaves many people sick, as we know, uh, uh, that the obesity is just enormous around the globe. And that's why it's because we have not a diverse food. We have a very starchy and meaty uh, food system which uh, is very costly, not only uh, from the production and the external, the external cost, which produces uh, in particular the health, health issues and environmental issues. So what is happening out there is that because of this uh, industrial agriculture, which is heavy on input, we are uh, going beyond the planetary boundary, beyond these boundaries, which the planet uh, can renew uh, the, those resources from nitrogen to phosphorus to land uh, to biodiversity just name it and the interesting thing actually is agriculture the way we do it today mostly it is responsible for much of those overshoots of our planetary boundary uh, therefore again we need to scroll uh, uh, back on, on this industrial agriculture promotion on a global scale and go back to an agriculture which is in harmony, in tune uh, with the environment, which regenerates our natural resources. That's also where the term of organic uh, regenerative agriculture comes from, is because you want to generate natural resources. So what can agriculture and organic farming contribute then? And again, it's well described in this report from the CFS on agroecological and other, you know, other innovations. So if you don't have it, look at it. 
but we need to understand actually, you know, where do we come from with this problem? You know, how do we create it? And what we need to understand, I think, very well also when we looked at, at the agroecology, why agroecology, is because um, in the past we had ecosystem services. So these four boxes on the bottom there, uh, we have the pollination, the, the pest control, the water cycling, the nutrient cycling. And these are ecosystem services which are provided free to the farmers, to our family, smallholder farmers, uh, uh, globally, everywhere. But you see, for some people, this wasn't really good enough because you couldn't make any money with this since it's the nature provided for free. So we said, well, why don't we remove all this and we sell it to the farmer in, in bags, you know, in bags of seeds, GMO seeds if possible, bags of fertilizer, pesticides or container. Uh, also, we instead of having all these nice soils with a lot of organic matter, we're just going to do irrigation like crazy all over. Uh, so here, uh, we, we have created a, 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 an agriculture which has become a disaster for society, for the economy and also the environment. It's also linked actually to the diets and, um, you know, a, a diet is heavy in starchy food and meat. It cannot be good for the planet. And here also, again, you know, if you look at the health boundary, our health, uh, which is so important in times of like COVID, uh, we can see how we, we, we are lacking a working immune system. And why? It's because we nourish ourselves in the wrong way. Uh, so again, we need to <clears throat> consider this. And the food system cannot change unless we also uh, change the way we eat. And uh, from a system on the right hand side, which is in harmony with nature, we went to an agriculture which is totally black, dark, uh, produces a lot of CO2 instead of actually uh, helping uh, removing it. And this is the diets from a, a healthy diet. We went into this heavy meat and, and dairy and, and uh, starchy food uh, diet. So we're going to have to rechange it back to a diet which is more appropriate because simply the natural resources of the planet are not enough to continue in the same way as we are doing right now. So it's not only transforming agriculture. Uh, the, the condition behind this is also transforming our diets. So agroecology and organic, yes, are a better practice or a better approach. And uh, India actually has a lot of very good examples. Uh, in a study, uh, my foundation, Biovision, did with uh, some other organizations, uh, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, for example, uh, we identified more than 100 very good examples of agroecology uh, and transformation of food systems around the world, many of them also in India. So it's not so that it doesn't exist. There's proof. Um, and we have the evidence that it can be done. So what do we? What we're talking about <clears throat> is to um, take the industrial agriculture and the subsistence agriculture and go towards a diversified agroecological farming. And I would add here food system. Uh, given that under the latest definition of agroecology, uh, food systems are uh, included all the way to consumption. It's the same for organic 3.0, where but they um, overlap very much with what agroecological practices are recommending. And it's interesting also that everything, you know, a lot of what is needed is actually under our feet, right there, the soil. And that has been ignored for way too long life in the soil. We need living soils. We don't want dead soils. Um, the soils who uh, are regenerated. Soils who we need to feed the soils so that they can feed the plants and the plants and the people, the animals, etc. So this is the logic, I think, behind a lot of agroecology is to be uh, mindful of the value of the soil. And there's a lot of uh, uh, work read right on publication about the value of soil, what we need to do. And again, examples, plenty. Uh, I, I just can mention one here, a push pull, which is an integrated growing system where you have legumes, uh, uh, cereals, um, and, and you know, these are the two main crops, uh, which uh, will bind CO2 in the ground because there's uh, grasses also in that system which we deep root, which are perennial grasses, 
uh, roots down to two meters or more. So that's what we're talking about here when agriculture, which is actually uh, uh, taking care of climate change, not promoting it, but actually removing carbon. We also have plants in the system who provide the nitrogen fertilizer. You don't have to make it artificially with a lot of pollution, transport, etc. It can be done in situ. And this type of system are also very good in promoting uh, a natural insect and disease uh, control, never mind also weed control. So it exists and we know that. Uh, we also know that the diversity and the biodiversity is key to sustainability and resilience. Uh, you know, if you have high crop diversity, you, you have more employment and diverse employment, uh, uh, good employment. Um, and with low crop diversity, you have much less. And I think this is, there's a lot of evidence out there. So what do we want? I mean, the choice is clear. We want a diverse food system, again, like agroecology is promoting. And now with all this nice evidence, we know what to do, there's science behind it. So, so what is standing in the way? It's the concentration of power. And that's what we have done another study uh, by Vision Foundation, uh, IPES food, the food panel of experts. Um, and we found out that this concentration of power is really, I think, at the center of blocking uh, change. It can be the idea of cheap food, which is actually going against the farmer and the farmer earning a proper uh, income. Um, export orientation, everyone wants to be an export nation. Uh, in, in my uh, meeting with uh, PM Modi four years ago, he said, you know, we want to become the biggest exporter of food. I mean, okay, we didn't tell him then that maybe what about making sure that the Indians are nourished well first. Uh, others can grow their own food, with the exception of Monaco and Singapore, I think everyone can do it. Um, path dependency, this green evolution idea, and what, what is success? How many kilograms per hectare, or actually like Mandana Shiva likes to say, a health per acre, or health per hectare. And then we think short term all the time, you know, quick things, things have to happen very, very quickly. And again, that's not gonna be in agriculture. Agriculture is, is for the long term, we need to maintain our soils, etc. So that, and, and behind all this is just money. And so the report I mentioned just before is about money flows. And when you understand the money flows, uh, you understand power. And it has been shown right now in this report, you know, how much money is going still today in the wrong direction. Basically support green revolution agricultural research rather than organic uh, permaculture, uh, agroecology. And uh, when we tried to sort of map out, you know, agroecology and the other alternatives out there, all right, we have permaculture, which sort of straddles the agroecology, because why are the ones straddling around there? It's because they don't include the food system, you know, the whole transformation, the consumption, consumption issue. Um, and uh, in India, you have, again, the zero budget farming, which is a very interesting uh, way forward. Again, you know, they all are sort of in and out partly. And I think that we need to try as much as possible to see, you know, how can we really uh, become fully encompassing uh, with agro the, all these other alternatives? You now, how can they uh, come into the agroecology, regenerative agriculture uh, realm? So when we go from, uh, where do we go from? You know, so we have all this problems and we go to solutions and that's what I think it's all about. Uh, an agriculture which has less greenhouse gases, less soil erosion and actually rebuilding soils. We don't, we would not stop to lose our biodiversity, which means seed uh, conservation uh, and land races, which is very important, ecologically adapted. Uh, water, yeah, we have a problem everywhere. So why don't we have soils which can absorb water like with a lot of organic material. Uh, we have this rural poverty, which how is it possible that farmers are poor when they provide the essential uh, uh, element for life, for everybody. They ought to be the richest, not the poorest. Um, Non-communicable diseases, as we just uh, seen. Uh, chemical residues everywhere, which uh, are uh, impinging on our immune system. 
So we can reverse all this. We have everything we need to, to, to make those changes. Again, that means also that we have to rearrange the powers of the center of the system and the power has to go back to the farmers uh, and, and get away from the lawyers. And uh, when we apply what we know, again, you can look at agroecology on the left here with the five levels or at FAO 10 elements uh, of agroecology, which is a very interesting way of presenting this. They are totally overlap actually, you know, between agroecology and those 10 elements. Uh, and you can see that resilience there in the center, this is the key thing. And because of climate change, because of societal issues, uh, I think we need uh, that resilience in the system. And we have seen in the COVID pandemic right now that our resilience is basically null, zero, doesn't work. And, and, and so, so we have to rethink that system according to the principles of agroecology uh, very, very quickly. And uh, we have the tool for that. We have, uh, we have given by the international community the sustainable development goals. If you look at those, you can see that if we want to achieve them, we need agroecology. We need an agriculture which is regenerative, which uh, provides food security uh, uh, under the principle of food sovereignty. So this is all uh, you know, packaged very well in those SDGs. So why don't we try to, to uh, meet them? And we have a, a legal framework to do that now. So it's there, we, we can use it. And it's not perfect, we know that too, but I think we can go long ways. And so um, if we take our food system uh, through the SDGs with agroecology, we can get back in the green zone of our planetary boundaries. And that's the whole idea here, is that we use existing uh, 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 frameworks like the SDGs, existing science, agroecology is a science, is a practice. Uh, and and for, with this, we can save our planet and ourselves. Um, one of the biggest leverage, and maybe uh, Ulrich will talk a bit about this also, uh, we have is um, a true costing and I think that through uh, really do full cost accounting is probably one of the best leverage points we have to make those changes and here the investments which are being made or not actually in terms of agroecology the green part is what uh, the governments have been putting into agroecology in international development support you can see except for Switzerland it's very abysmal and again, even everywhere, we were very generous in looking at, okay, so, you know, what do we consider agroecology? So with such a picture, how do you want to make the change? It's impossible. So we need changing, again, where we invest our money. So we have a lot of challenges. Still, the research is inadequate. Uh, we need more um, organic permaculture agroecology research institutions we need to get rid of all the traditional and, and the one we don't need them we don't need any more uh, green revolution agriculture a lack of conducive and coherent policies because co policies need to be coherent and they are not we, we give subsidies in on the one way to do the wrong thing and then we try to uh, do some good thing on the other side you know that's just balancing each other out no progress weak knowledge extension and advisory system so again yeah um, we need better training opportunity, which connect to better uh, uh, research. Um, the negative image uh, organic agriculture, uh, agroecology has, you know, for not being productive enough, everybody is going to go hungry and all this. We need to work on this. And uh, again, that's linked to how much money is involved in there. Um, uh, again, you know, with the prevailing diets right now, global values of more uh, money, more um, uh, uh, harvest per hectare, that's not what it's going to bring us to agroecology and organic regenerative agriculture. And right now, I want to mention the strong headwind we have from vested interest. You know, they are really now battling uh, every move for agroecology, as can be seen also in the Food Systems Summit, something which was started by the private sector, the, the World Economic Forum, rather than by civil society and the farmers and the UN itself. So they were brought into this, but pushed around by the wrong people. So to sum up, agroecology is available uh, and the best approach for improving agriculture and the food system. 
And uh, for this, you know, we need broad conc uh, concrete policy actions. Again, that's through the SDGs. I think we can do a lot. Uh, SDG 2, zero hunger is one important one. And I think we need to consider all of them and also the, the, how they work with each other in terms of creating synergies. And then, yeah, when? What are we waiting for? Time is now and we know how to do it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, we'll uh, meet again in the uh, discussion panel. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, for this outstanding presentation and laying to us what the main issues are and also what the solutions are. So with that, uh, I'd like to now invite Mr. Ulrich Hoffman, to please share his thoughts on, on agroecology and the work that he has been doing for several years. Over to you, Ulrich. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to Hans Herren <laughs> on, the, on the other side of the globe. Um, I'm very grateful for having been asked to contribute uh, to the webinar and um, uh, in, in preparing um, for the meeting and having second thoughts on the subject, I, I found it uh, useful um, to um, focus on two, my presentation on two subjects. And that is, um, on the one hand, uh, de on demystifying the productivity narrative. Uh, and on the other hand, um, a few observations on how to reconnect to local markets. I think both of these subjects are extremely important um, for putting or for couching uh, agroecology in, into the uh, correct, uh, uh, at least, uh, conceptual context. So the first um, observation I'd like to make is uh, uh, placing the concept of productivity into an appropriate context. Uh, so productivity in, in farming can be measured in many ways. Um, Generally, and, and that is sort of the perception uh, of, I would say, 90, 95%, if not 99% of, of people engaged in agriculture is that productivity is measured per, per area unit in, in terms of crop yield. However, one can also express productivity as per person hour in other words, that is labor productivity. Then one can measure it as per unit of deployed capital, which is capital productivity. And finally, there's, uh, the there's an option to measure it per energy input or water input. So in other words, resource productivity or I would rather call it resource efficiency. The comparison can consider total biological production, ecosystem services, or only what is directly useful to human beings in the form of food, fiber, or energy. What is important in this regard is to pose the following question. Can we even talk about productivity if the production is based on the unsustainable use of irrigation, fossil fuel, and soil management practices that erode the soil? Um, Hans Herren used the, to the, the term, the, the um, the, the, the treasure, the soil, the living soils, the treasure is under our feet. So uh, living soils are at the center uh, of uh, truly sustainable agriculture. And against this background, 
Agroecology is all too often disdained as antiquated or primitive. And this I would call is real fake news. So the, let's look at the productivity concept in conventional green revolution agriculture. So here productivity is generally expressed as a yield of a monocrop. It is high external input dependent on mechanization, chem chemization, fuel, etc. Very fossil fuel dependent to the degree that one can that one can um, go so far to say oil rather than soil is plays the the utmost role. There is an industrial logic of specialization, scale, and cost cutting behind that. There's little relation with local resource limits and local resource endowment. And uh, there is generally a global market focus. So what results uh, here is, um, it is all, all, all these elements and inputs are principal, have the principal objective to um, enhance labor productivity. So to drive labor productivity to, to the maximum. And, and that is generally um, on, 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 um, on the back of a high external input dependence. So what we have here is that in the end, the, the, the productivity approach boils down to resource mining. So now uh, let's swing the pendulum towards uh, uh, the productivity concept under agroecology. Here productivity should be measured in to as total biological yield and contribution to public goods and services. Uh, bearing in mind that a farmer is not only a producer of an agricultural product, but also a manager of, uh, of an, uh, uh, um, an agroecological system. So we have in this context closed nutrient cycles and natural crop protection as illustrated by, by Hans Herren's presentation. We have diverse integrated and high resilient production. So in other words, soil, and not oil. So here, what results is uh, that we focus on total factor or system productivity. And these, this productivity has local limits. It is also, the, this approach is local and indigenous knowledge intensive, so it is skill intensive. And the focus is primarily on the local environment, the local um, uh, um, endowment, but also local markets and not a global market focus. So what we have here as, as expressed uh, as productivity is a reproductive capacity of the local agroecological system. And in the end, this boils down to strengthening the resource base and self-determination. So it is a very autonomous, a self-determined self uh, 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 approach based on this different, very different productivity concept. 
let's now talk to uh, let's now turn to the my my the second point i'd like to make and that is the importance of consumer and community supported approaches including for marketing the productivity approach of agroecology um, as we have just discussed that implies that the focus is on sustainable systems rather than on individual products. The local regional focus within re the, the reproductive capacity of the resource base. So one should not pretend that you know, the, the, the resources are available in a limitless, uh, in a limitless fashion. So one has to one has to bear in mind what are what are the local specifics and what what is what are also the limits it enables also regional food fiber and energy sovereignty it provides important social goods and services and as Hans Herren emphasized, it enhances resilience, climate adaptation of local resource base, and the product portfolio that is locally adapted and in line with consumer needs. Ultimately, the creation of new markets, knowledge systems, and governance structures in, all, in order to circumvent highly entrenched power relations is possible but also required so that is not given uh, as such but it is a power struggle so now what 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 can be done on reconnecting to local markets some degree of reconnection to local markets culture and community are crucial in order to break free of the industrial model. These shifts allow consumers and other actors of short local value chains to communicate their preferences. Through the establishment of farmer markets, sorry, through local procurement, public procurement, through direct marketing arrangements with restaurants or canteens, direct online marketing, or sales through farm shelves or farmer group run shops. The detachment from global markets and the relocalization of agriculture also offer more remunerative prices because of no or little global competition and better farmer consumer communication and connections and new financing mechanisms uh, here we talk about payments as remuneration for social goods and services provided by agroecology so no longer uh, um, outright subsidies uh, no matter uh, on what basis but what we talk about is uh, public money for delivering or for generating public goods and public services. So if we focus more on, uh, on uh, uh, local markets, what we also do is one achieves a higher degree of sovereignty. So it's, it's, it's production and food sovereignty and strengthening local economic ties so under achieving sovereignty it's delinking from large national and international supply chains and therefore also from the cost pressure and and um, uh, contractual terms um, which are often uh, one-sided then selecting most suitable crops and products so including those crops and products which are well known locally and appreciated practicing integrated farming so reintegrating uh, uh, crop and, and crop uh, 
forming an animal husbandry and closed nutrient cycles and becoming energy self-sufficient. And finally, one autonomously decides on investment, employment, and remuneration. So on strengthening local economic ties, one establishes local and regional forward and backward linkages. They create new or additional business and employment opportunities, as, as Hans Herren already uh, uh, flagged. Con the, the contribution to improving local technical and social infrastructure, the value added remains in the region, and it is enhancing attractiveness of agriculture, in particular for the young, young generation, which by definition discourages migration. So to close, um, a, a publication of IPS Food um, on agroecology uh, put it, uh, put it in, in, in one phrase, which is the following, overcoming the lock-ins of industrial food systems may require communities to construct what are effectively parallel systems of production, marketing, retail, values, and governance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ulrich, for that excellent presentation and hitting the nail on the head uh, several times. Uh, I have a couple of uh, I, I have a couple of questions, which uh, I think. Uh, Hans, are you also there? I mean, I don't see Hans. There. The, okay, Hans, you're also there. So let me, uh, before uh, before the questionnaires start kicking in, I have a, uh, well, not a question actually. Well, actually, it's it's. I would like you to elaborate, Hans. In one of your slides, you mentioned about what and who stands in the way of transformation. And you did mention about the eight lock-ins and the concentration of power as the center. Can you elaborate a little bit on how this concentration of power functions? And uh, you know, maybe that that's a good start. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Rajiv. Um, yeah. Actually, this is um, something you know. That's. Uh, in the report of 2016, it's called From Uniformity to Diversity, uh, the EPS Food uh, Report, and uh, I'm a member on the panel. And as we were writing this uh, report uh, and looking at this power structure, it, it occurred to me that, oh, there's something more, because what is this power, really? And this power is, is the money. And uh, when you take this one step further, then you are, so where is the money coming from? And who is supposed to fund agricultural research, extension, uh, and work in the, in the nutrition food system? Governments over the years, thanks to the World Bank and others, have reduced their contributions and their support for agriculture in general, and let the private sector take over. And that has been actually a big problem because it is sort of, uh, uh, the government not taking care of their responsibility to assure food security for the people. And they said, well, don't worry, what well, the private sector will do it. And they were more than happy to take over because they can see, you know, you have to eat three times a day or two times or once, whatever you can afford, but you have to eat. And so there's no better system to make money is to, to have something where there's a lock-in to begin with. And so I think it's the abdication of the governments on their role and responsibility in the food, which has allowed the, the, the power structure we have today to take over. And these are the, the John Deere, the, the Monsanto, the Syngenta, the Namem, or the Yara, the whole fertilizer folks, and today also the IT folks, you know, with the data um, and, and, and the, the, the big... Uh, race to accumulate as many data as possible which again should be in the private uh, in the public domain and that's why also the problem with government not funding research is that 
from the private sector, it becomes a private good and not a public good. And so, 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 so that's where I think we have this enormous problem now uh, to, to backtrack because government will tell you, well, we don't have the money, private sector should do it. And then, then you, you get what you get. And it's the private sector. It's not only the industry, it's also uh, the big philanthropists like Bill Gates who continues to support actually a private sector which is now 50 years behind shadow with, 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 with what they are trying to do. Uh, we know much better, and I think Ulrich has already given a fantastic presentation, which was lining out also the details. And, you know, clearly you can see, you know, how how far we went in the wrong way, and uh, and how much uh, uh, work we have to do to put things back uh, in, into the right um, uh, direction. And the, the issue of globalization versus localization has come to fore very very nicely, I think with the, uh, the COVID-19, where a lot of those local food systems have been rebuilt in no time, in a few months, or even in our valley here where I live. It, it, they had created a new farmer's market which didn't exist. Because it, it, even in a place where you think everything is organized very well, it broke down. So, so um, I, I think we, we have long ways to go, but we also know what to do. I think this is the advantage we have right now. We, we wouldn't know. But, the powers in place need to be challenged. Thank you, uh, Hans. Uh, Ulrich, uh, I wanted to uh, sort of uh, talk to you about, or I actually wanted you to elaborate. You mentioned about the concept of productivity under agroecology, which I think is very interesting. And you mentioned about total biological yield and public goods and services. Now, uh, what I wanted to ask you was the monetary value uh, in, in another report, the IASTD report that Hans mentioned, which I think uh, uh, it would be very interesting for our participants. And Hans, maybe if you could share the link of that report uh, on the chat box, that would be great. You mentioned that the monetary value of agricultural ecosystem services is estimated to be higher than the total value of agricultural production. And you also mentioned about internalization of social and environmental costs and compensation for ecosystem services as a silver bullet for overcoming market failures. And you also mentioned that uh, the, it's uh, very complex regulations and government interventions are required to bring ecosystem services in. Yeah. Can you elaborate a little bit or can you throw some more light on this, uh, Ulrich? Yeah, thank you, um, Rajiv. Look, as, as, as Hans said, um, we have a system, a, a present system, which is um, unfortunately uh, all too often called modern agriculture. Um, which is a form which basically employs an industrial logic to agriculture, which is misplaced. So what we actually have is we have a mining of local resources, uh, irrespective of the existing capacities and endowments. And all this is made possible by basically uh, using excessively external inputs mostly of course in the end it boils down to to fuel or to to energy so in the form of uh, fertilizers agrochemicals um, the mechanization um, and then uh, also um, the uh, the marketing and the processing and um, the the irony is the following, as Hans uh, Herren uh, pointed out, look, agriculture normally is a kind of a closed system, can be a closed system. So it can be a closed system um, which reproduces uh, uh, its nutrients, it reproduces its production base, um, it, it tries to enrich the soil, maintain diversity, and the like. And also, of course, 
uh, achieves an income which is adequate um, uh, for, for the local circumstances. And what we have is, um, as Hans already um, illustrated, the, the private sector in the last 20, 30 years has, has broken into that. Uh, basically, the, it has disrupted this uh, self-sufficient, uh, in closed interior cycle. Uh, and all of that uh, to, to make the farmers completely dependent on external inputs and external markets. And uh, what happened was that the more you get dependent on long supply chains, you tend to end up in, in, in a cost treadmill. So the competition will become so intense. On the one hand, the, the agro uh, chemical inputs uh, are in, tend to increase in price. When you look at historical data, it clearly shows you know, that, that the prices have increased more dynamically, the input prices, than the output prices. Um, mm -hmm. Then often you are made dependent on one particular supplier or company. Uh, and, and in some cases, this is even a technological uh, sort of hiccup. So you make, uh, you, you tie certain agrochemicals or, or certain seeds to a particular um, uh, 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 plant protection technique and inputs. <laughs> um, you know, um, the, the, the example of, of Monsanto or, or, or Bayer, uh, so to, to use uh, Roundup uh, uh, in, in connection with, with particular seed varieties. So as a matter of fact, in the end, you are confronted, the farmer is confronted with a whole package of, a, of what, what, is, what they call a quality assurance system. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is anything but a quality insurance system. That is a system of modern slavery. So they make you dependent. You pay uh, an increasingly high price. They make you... Um, marketing-wise, extremely dependent on on uh, on uh, distant markets, uh, where the prices are highly competitive. So in the end, you realize that there is a gap between your production costs and 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 what you get uh, in in sales value. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you end up in a treadmill. And you know these uh, these cases in India, you know the waves of of, of suicides in agriculture. Uh, the in 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 many developed countries, that sort of uh, huge gap, it, the cost uh, to price gap, is being closed by by subsidies, by government subsidies. But it 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 should be clearly said: look, the subsidies, although they are handed out to the farmers, in most cases, they serve the interests of all these agrochemical uh, uh, companies, uh, it, the banks who, which provide financing, um, the landowners, etc. Because if the farmers are broke, they, they, cannot, they cannot pay. So in other words, you have a system which even financially is, is not self-sufficient and, and autonomous, it is permanently dependent on a, on a cash flow input from outside. So, and what, 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 what we have, however, is that this cash flow injection uh, is based on a system or it, it finances expenses which are highly destructive from a reproductive point of view. So, what what we now uh, what we now are confronted with is to say, let's break this dependence. So you have to get out of this uh, dependence on supply chain, on 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 the external input providers, uh, and you make your system in a, in a real sense reproductive and self-sustained, and that is both production-wise 
that is money wise um, so so that that you get uh, that you save on on the one hand on on the inputs because most of the inputs come from your own from your own farm or neighboring farm collective approaches uh, so you save extremely on on the input side and at the same time you establish new markets direct markets uh, with with consumers who appreciate your 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 not only your products but all the services uh, and and frankly speaking uh, what is what is lacking in most cases is that governments have to be i would say one has to no, no longer argue but put enormous pressure on governments so that they give up uh, on the present approach on handing out subsidies no longer tied to any preconditions so uh, flat subsidies uh, based on on um, on acreage etc uh, so they should be tied so public money should only be dashed out uh, to uh, for the achievement or for the delivery of public goods and services and and these public goods and services are for sure being um, produced or generated uh, by um, uh, by let's say the, the the production methods we are talking about so that is uh, the link between on the one hand the production methods uh, the financial situation and on the other hand the um, the the markets the only uh, the, the the issue why this is so so difficult and a, and a strong uphill battle is put yourself in the shoes of a large company like Bayer and all of a sudden you have a discussion with the managers and tell them look we no longer need your inputs we no longer need your advice uh, and in fact even for markets um, we create our own so you so you become completely independent and self-sufficient so that means their market <laughs> evaporates and that is the point so so if 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 you are very consequent on agroecology uh, basically agroecology if is becomes self-sufficient it becomes very dynamic it caters for local markets and local uh, and local resources and therefore uh, all these external input providers become let's say what uh, useless but for them this is a market and they are fighting tooth and nail to preserve that and unfortunately some of the big foundations the international foundations like the Gates Foundation you know they are preaching this industrial model um, uh, and, and, and come now they, they tend to replace you know the, the classical agro ecological inputs um, with, with, uh, with, with issues like big, big data you know um, uh, uh, the drones, um, uh, the the, um, uh, uh, the new uh, new methods of, of of GMOs, so the the gene engineering, etc. But all of that is is let's say it is not affordable for the for the normal farmer, even in the West, let alone in developing countries. Thank you so much, uh, Ulrich. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Prashant Pastore from Solidaridad Asia. Uh, Prashant, can you please switch on the video and please join in as a panelist? Uh, Prashant is the general manager who heads the water and the sustainable agricultural uh, part of the work that Solidaridad is doing. Prashant? Hi, Rajiv. Thank you. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear such uh, revolutionary, I would say, not just inspiring uh, this talk from both uh, Professor Hans and Professor Ulrich. And, uh, and and what a day it is like. It's a World Soil Day. So congratulations and uh, I think happy World Soil Day to everyone because that's the basis which we are kind of all of us with multiple approaches trying to uh, change and fundamentally improve upon for the for, for what we are aiming. But uh, uh, so Rajiv, uh, I just uh, have a one, maybe a comment or, or and a few questions. Uh, if 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 I am allowed to kind of put forward yes. to 
Thank Please you. Please feel free. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we see this debate is going on, like, and 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 this is the the the, the conversation is on, like, agroecology is becoming, it's gaining traction in and it's emerging fast emerging as a one scientifically driven uh, uh, debate which is talking out talking about fundamentally shifting the food system uh, how we how we look into the food system and how the food system in future will look like and it can play a significant role but there are multiple things that we we are a smallholder based economy in the world population and and professor only talked about uh, uh, improving the reproductive capacity of uh, local ecological system, but look at the reproductive capacity. What has done that the world population we are, and then it is the talk. And and one of the fundamental shift which happened over the past 30, 40, 50 years that the there are more and more cities are emerging, and it is becoming big big uh, urban centers, and and there is a shift of population which is happening moving towards urban center. So how you see the agroecological role, agroecology can play a role between the food system we have today and the city food system which will emerge because almost more than 60% of the world population will be urban in next 10 years or, or much more than that and we are seeing in many countries. And and especially how you place it and, and there, will, there, there will be immense demand for the food how you see that agroecology, which is fundamentally going down to the uh, foundation of uh, of production system, will play a role in this kind of a world where there is a majority lives in a city. So that's that's one first first point of question I would like to ask. Thank you. So I, uh, between Ulrich and Hans, you could decide whoever is, yeah. uh, can answer that question. Go ahead, uh, Rick. You're the economist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, look, um, my my feeling is that um, the, the, we have a situation globally um, where we have dysfunctional agricultural markets. I mean, besides um, uh, uh, the, the the fuel market agriculture is the most distorted one as a matter of fact hardly anybody including most farmers know exactly what their costs are and as a matter of fact what the rules in the in the marketing are because you know that when you when you buy when you buy uh, in a in let's say in a street market or in a supermarket, you often uh, question or, or pose yourself the question, okay, how my, what's the share of all those um, players in the supply chain? And you realize that the, 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 the producer is often not getting more than anything between 5 and 10%. Uh, and um, Look, in, in most developed countries, um, farmers, in fact, tend to get 40 to 60% of their income straight from the government's budget. So in terms of subsidies. Um, it is, as a matter of fact, there are some recent initiatives in Europe uh, they, origi they, they originated in France, and they are called, who is the boss here? Uh, it, it is an, an attempt, and, 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 and look, it, it is a, it's a rare exception, but it's based on a, on a sort of um, questionnaire circulated among real consumers to say, what are we as consumers prepared to pay for a liter of organic milk okay which is which is locally produced so it's not coming from you know uh, from new zealand or so uh, and and on that basis then 
the, the organizer said, okay, we need approximately a share of 25 to 30% for, for retail uh, and about 25% uh, for processing. So then that leaves at least 50% for the producer. Uh, and, and of course, by deducting the costs, etc., at least here, what, what, what this achieved was that it got to the point that the producers um, are recovering <laughs> more than just their costs. So although this milk, a liter of milk, is, is, tends to be uh, well above price, well above market average, uh, it sells quite well in the market because consumers sort of say, okay, um, we are doing something directly for local producers and we know um, for sure what is their share. Uh, the whole thing is that unless you follow a, a, a bit in, in the market, this principle and, and at the same time, discuss the issue of how to reform um, subsidies. So, in fact, forget about subsidies. In fact, reduce drastically or even abolish subsidies and only pay remuneration for provided public goods and services. And all of a sudden, the, let's say, a, 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 a peasant producer, a peasant, a small scale producer, which under normal circumstances, let's say, would pay, would, would produce a liter of organic milk, whether certified or not, for about, at the moment, 60 cents European, Euro cents per liter. That's the cost. And is, is paid by the best paying um, purchaser, so generally, generally the dairy, the da dairy factory, uh, the, the, the highest price is 40 cents. So there's a gap of 20. In fact, it's one third. And this gap under present circumstances would no longer exist if we change the logic. So we change the logic and say, the, the, the subsidies are no longer paid. We are only paying for environmental goods and services. And the organic producer provides evidence, yes, my cows are, are, are grazing. Uh, you know, I contribute to, um, uh, to landscape maintenance, to water quality. So I'm not having an industrial feedlock, you know, where you have a big problem with liquid manure, etc. Um, I contribute to, to climate change, uh, I, I mean, little. I, 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 in fact, I increase resilience. Um, I um, provide input for, for soil uh, improvements, etc. And even I provide more employment, okay? So in the end, in the end, uh, that's the approach to take. But at the moment, but at the moment, what you have is you have a system which has this, this gap between the producing costs and what is remunerated by the, 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 the buyers in the supply chains. And that gap is being halfway, halfway um, evened out by the subsidies. And the subsidies are huge. I mean, if you, if you get 40 to 60% of, of your total income, direct from the from the from the government i mean it's clear the whole system is is thank you bro yeah, thank, thank you Rick. thank you uh, so uh, yeah so i'll just uh, move into the uh, i mean we have several questions so prashant just permit me to yeah, sure. so so uh, um, i don't know how I'm, i'll try and do justice so the first question was from uh, dr venu gopalan uh, who says that agroecology is local knowledge intensive rather than input mm. intensive. Uh, local knowledge is being eroded 
while efforts are on to conserve natural resources, how do we document, preserve, share, and enrich local knowledge across the globe? He feels very less attention is paid uh, is being paid on this front. So, Hans, would you like to take that uh, question? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I think you know what we just been talking about is this localization of the food system. And I think part of this is to do research with the farmers on farm at a very local level. I think this is important because it, it, you have such differences, even you know, between a few kilometers from one place to the other, uh, you cannot apply research which has been done far away to everything. There's some type of research, yes, who is more universal. Uh, but I think that you can connect the farmers, their knowledge, to the research and to the science part. So uh, there's nothing there which you know stands in the way, except again, uh, governments who have basically less money or fewer monies available for that type of research because they delegated it to the private sector. And the private sector is not going to make local research. Why? I mean, that's a waste of money for them. They want one variety over as many thousands of hectares as possible. Uh, they want uniformity. They don't, they don't want diversity. So that's the one thing. The other, I think, which uh, we, we need to um, uh, quickly mention also is that, you know, agroecology is not only for small and micro farms. You can provide, you, you can do agroecology, regenerative agriculture, organic on larger scale. You have to be careful that it is actually sustainable, uh, resilient, which is not always the case in, in organic as it's done today in many places. It's dependent on a lot of external inputs, in particular the, the nutrients for the soil. But uh, that can be changed also. And farmers need to organize themselves. I mean, this is important. You know, you want to go to, to the city, to the markets, you need larger quantities. So, all right, then you farmers group, on a, again, this localized system, can pull together their production and <clears throat> uh, um, sell it to the retailers in those cities. Yes, I mean, how are you going to provide enough food for a billion people in, uh, in Shanghai, for example, right? I mean, uh, the little farms around town can produce only so much for little markets. But I think we have to re rethink that whole marketing system also in some ways by helping farmers to, to aggregate their production. Uh, maybe they need sort of managers uh, who would buy their stuff, put it together, but they own those companies. <clears throat> and like we do in our little valley where I live here, we have all these organic farmers here near San Francisco. And we are organized uh, and with the farmers are shareholders of a company who actually does the marketing, bring us to the market. Because you know they, they have to be in the field. They cannot run to the market every other day. Uh, so they created their own company, but it's owned by the farmers. So I think Thank there you. are ways of doing this. Thank you, Hans. Uh, before I uh, before I hand over to Prashant once again, I want to take up a question of, uh, which has been which is asked by Litul. I think is very relevant to the work that we do. How do we bring agroecological principles into cash crops, such as cotton, tea, coffee, etc., which is highly export oriented? Should we look beyond the food system? Perhaps Hans, you would like to. Well, you know, I mean, you can take, thank you, the of, of cotton. I mean, there's a lot of uh, organic cotton and there's a big demand for it, which is not even satisfied fully. So I think there are uh, potential uh, there already, which we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think that the issue here is, again, a lot has to do with pricing. And, you know, who gets what money, uh, who produces what. So to me, it looks like that there's no... And if you take it seriously, Agroecological production should actually be cheaper in the end. Yeah. I mean, I know there's the labor productivity thing there. Ulrich is going to come back and say, yeah, but you know, if you have big machines, you, uh, you have less labor costs. Uh, but to me, it looks like, you know, we need to deal with that also in one way or another. And just like for food, cotton for the fiber and for the feed, we need to make sure that we do full cost accounting. And then you will see that all the cheap stuff is going to be eliminated from the market because it will become more expensive. And I think I'll, something which I think uh, saying from Feeble and others in organic is that organic food is not uh, uh, too expensive. Yeah. It is the other one which is too cheap. Yeah. This Thank is you. the thing. And we need to understand that. 
Now, again, we have to deal with equity issues also, because yeah. you cannot solve agricultural problem without looking at the economic system, at the inequalities, inequities in the world. And that's what makes the thing complicated for, for many people. It's complicated because you, you have to take a systems approach beyond agriculture to solve agricultural problems. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Prashant, you wanted to come in very, very quickly, so that, uh, uh, well, if, with, with everybody's permission, if we can exceed I, I, yeah. by five minutes, if we started no, I, five minutes, just a minute, Prashant, once if we yeah. start five minutes late, so if, if, if it's okay with everyone, we can uh, close the meeting at 8.35. Prashant, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rajiv, again. I just wanted to make a quick comment, like uh, we, we are talking about uh, structural bringing structure changes in a fundamental changes in in the current uh, business as usual or or the various efforts but just wanted to like there are multiple efforts like there are many organizations including solidarity like for last 50 years working on various standards frameworks roundtables and everybody has one aim that making the system more efficient and sustainable and 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 have a vision that everybody has its fair share in the in the world and and, it, and coming back to the point which was fundamentally mentioned uh, by by Professor Ulrich about uh, uh, it's all about management of chemicals, pesticides, fossil fuel. But I think there is there are frameworks which is try to improvise and make them efficient. But again, they are doing efficiency of these usage and agroecology is fundamentally going different. What we need to uh, do is that the, these these are very important. Uh, principles and uh, and the, and the production system i think there is a there's a way of taking them along rather than totally uh, revolutionary uh, approach of upsetting the system i think creating the hotspot approach and and then they take the journey along and where we have to bring all the partners even the private sector together so that's the uh, comment i wanted to bring along quickly in this in this particular conversation thank you very much okay. Thank you, Prashant. Uh, well, uh, we have lots of questions coming in, so I'm going to take up a question that has been asked by Rajiv Mohanty, who's saying in terms of scaling up strategy of the agroecological principles, do you think the course curriculum of agricultural professionals in universities need to be re-engineered as, advoc as advocacy, or it needs to center around the community professional-centric agricultural extension processes. So I'm not sure between Ulrich and Hans who would like to answer this question briefly. And I think it's an important question considering we have a good amount of people from the agricultural research also present in this meeting. So perhaps Hans, would you like to take that up? Well, very quickly, but I'd like to, Ulrich also to add, I, I think that what we need to do is to re-engineer um, somehow uh, the, um, the teaching in universities, because it's still, and also the work done in research centers. We did an analysis of what kind of research is even being proposed for funding from uh, research institutions, like in Kenya, for example. Most of it is old-fashioned. Um, and also in universities, I think we, we need a new crop of young scientists, you know, with, with different worldviews uh, uh, to come um, in, 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 into, into practice. And um, on the donor side, the same. You know, we have old school people everywhere. We need to get rid of them. They need to get out of the, the way to the younger people who want to change things. Yeah, I would, I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, look, I, we put together a, a report on, um, on soil fertility, uh, uh, soil fertility stewardship uh, uh, three years ago. And uh, when we prepared this report, we discovered that on soil fertility, uh, when you look at the, um, at the curricula in most <laughs> European universities, there's relatively little <laughs> on soil fertility. In fact, they consider that a, a piece of dirt. It is there. Uh, instead of talking about, you know, the, the biological composition, the, the, the chemical composition, how can this be optimized? This is, I mean, I would say at best, this is a footnote. This is not a real subject 
uh, uh, taught and discussed about at length at universities. Mm. Um, the, the, second, uh, the second dilemma I would also see is, um, you know, indigenous local knowledge, the, the breadth and the depth of this knowledge and the specific, specificity is not recognized by universities. It is basically considered a, a matter of practice, you know, you, as you go along, you, you try to improve that. But, but there are ways, in, 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 in even in organized ways, of optimizing that. The interlinkages between formal research. So get out of the ivory towers um, of the universities, get to farmer field schools, etc. So all of that, even from a procedural point of view, is not being sufficiently, let's say, elaborated on at, 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 current, at, at the university at the moment. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, there are several questions. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to take up all those questions because of time, but uh, I would like to tell all the participants that the Solidarity Act is committed to bring agroecology to the forefront of India. And we will, this is a part of a series of talks and webinars that we are going to be doing. And we will reach out to uh, Ulrich and Hans to suggest more experts who could come and talk to us and we could have further dialogue. So I assure everyone that we will keep the interest going and we will see how we can uh, work this further. I just, uh, before I wind up, I just wanted to uh, make a short announcement that we have another webinar on the 11th of December, uh, which is called Food, Climate Change and Healthy Soils, The mm. Forgotten Link. And I think this is so well linked to uh, Hans, how nicely you say soil, and you put an L and you said soil nutrients live in soil. Mm. And uh, Ulrich, what you said, soil, not oil. And you also mentioned treasures are under our feet. And uh, for this webinar, we have uh, two very, very distinguished people. We have Professor Ratanlal, who recently won the World Food Prize Award in 2020. Mm. Mm. He is the founding uh, director of the Ratanlal School of Carbon Management and Sequestration. And then we have Andre Liu, who is the international yeah. director of Regenerational, Regeneration yeah. International. And also he was the IFORM, uh, pres president. Uh, president of IFORM for six years. Yes. So uh, please watch out for this uh, webinar. Uh, we will soon be announcing. Uh, with that, I would like to really sincere thanks to Ulrich and to Hans uh, for you know uh, accepting our invitation to participate in this uh, webinar and also Ulrich thank you so much for all the conversations I had with you building towards this webinar it really helped me I would say a very special thanks to the Solidarity team for making this possible Thank you, Shatadru. I know you've been in the background. Uh, Shatadru is a managing director of Solidarity at Asia, who encouraged us totally to go forward for this. So thank you, Shatadru. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Anumita for her efforts. La last but not the least, the wonderful participants that we had. Unfortunately, I can't see their names, but I will eventually look through them. We had 100 participants through and through, and several questions, which I think tells us how important this topic and this subject is. So with that note, I would like to wish you a very good day uh, to Hans, a good yes. evening to, to, to Ulrich, and a good night to most people in India. Thank you very much. And looking forward to seeing you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Well, thank you all. Nice to see you, Rick and uh, Rajiv. And, uh, Bye. Uh, Bye, Hans. We'll be there. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Appreciate Bye. it. Oh. Very much so.